Since the announcement of the Garmin Vector 3 pedals, I've been keen to get a hold of a pair. That was back in August, it's now mid-December. I finally have my pair, which have been delivered via, I got them via Johnny Appleseed here in Australia, $14.99 Australian and $10.20 delivered. So I've paid more than retail. Let's hope these work and work very, very well. I've never touched the Vector 1s or the Vector 2s because of those pods. I just wasn't keen on hanging something off the side of the pedals on each side and the torque wrench gymnastics required for correct wasn't my thing. That's why I've always used the P1s. You put them on the bike and go, you're done. These are exactly the same. So I'm super keen to get stuck into this box today. We'll do the unboxing. We'll go through some specs. We'll put them side by side with a pair of P1 pedals, a pair of Durace pedals. We'll get them on the bike. We'll go for a spin and we'll have a look at the data. Okay, let's get stuck into it. Onto the unboxing. Okay, we have the manual. Look, I'm not sure why they include the manual these days because to be honest, the manual should look like this. Okay, links below to Ray's full in-depth article as well, but there's the manual if we need to read it. Uh, we have a little plasticky thing, and here are the pedals themselves nicely wrapped. So two pedals, no pods. We have some blinkies happening already. The only other thing we have here is uh, a set of cleats. Okay, cleats, we have some washers, and we have the mounting hardware for the cleats. So there we go, everything that's in the box. We'll do a side-by-side -side comparison of pedal weights here. Starting on the left there, the Vector 3 pedals coming in at 323 grams. The PowerTap P1 pedals coming in as a pair 434 grams and a pair of Durace 9000 pedals coming in at 250 grams. So there's three sets of pedals all side by side and you can tell there's an obvious weight penalty for power pedals. Now I'll have a look at the stack height of these three different pedals. So the Vector 3s, PowerTap P1s and the Durace 9000s. The stack height that I'm looking at is the center spindle to the cleat interface there. These are claimed 12.2 millimeters, which is 1.7 millimeters higher than the Vector 2s and 1s. These are claimed 14 millimeters, and these are claimed 8.8. .8. I don't think that's quite 8.8. So pulling these out, so you can actually see the visual difference there. It's quite awkward to measure, but that's near on 12 mil, so that's spot on. 14.35. Five, give or take, but yep, sure, 14 mil there. Over to the Durace pedals, the center spindle is just below there. I've got a little mark on there. Again, not exact, but close enough. We've got about 10 and a half. So you can see the stack height on all those in order would be like that. So Durace, around 10 mil. Vector 3s, around 12. And the high tower's coming in at 14 mil over here on the P1s. Remembering that was just the pedal stack, doesn't take into account the cleat or your shoe either. A closer look at the cleats that come with the pedals here in the box. These are XU Star cleats. They look Keo compatible, but they're not look cleats themselves. So the float are a little different. The red ones here are six degrees. The red look Keo cleats are nine degrees. Other look Keo cleats are gray at 4.5 degree float and black, which is zero. These also come in black with zero. Things get a bit confusing. What's coming in the box here are the Six Degrees XU Star Look Keo compatible cleats. I will probably be going and getting the black ones with zero degree, but let's see how these go first. I suspect these pedals will be quite popular with people buying their first power meter and installing them themselves. As such, we will go through the manual here. It's quite simple and it is a lot different and a lot easier than the Vector 1 and 2s. Okay, onto the manual. First up, it tells you what's not in the box to install these pedals, which is a 15 mil pedal wrench or pedal spanner and some grease. Number two, nothing much to see there on the reverse, but just make sure your pedals are off and everything's clean. A little bit of grease on the spindle. Now there is a torque rating on these. Now this isn't for accuracy or power. 34 Newton meters pretty much just tells you snug them on tight so they don't fall off. That's not a requirement. It's a serving suggestion. Left pedal, repeat. And number seven is probably the most important step of the lot. What you've got here is a little indication that these pedals may poke through the crank a little bit too far. You can see that, and they may hit the chain. So they do supply some two mil 
washers just in case that happens and you put them between the pedal and the actual crank arm and it pulls it away. That's obviously not to scale here, but you can see what's going on there. It stops the pedal itself from clipping the chain. And once that's complete, you pair them to your head unit and right on. And I've got plenty of clearance there, so no need for the two mil washer on this side. The small contraption hanging off the crank here is a Powerbeat single power meter. It's a separate power meter. It is not associated with the Garmin vector pedals. That's the left Garmin Vector 3 installed and the Powerbeat G2 is over here as well at the same time. So again, that is a separate power meter, not part of this system. Installation of the pedals there was super easy. Anybody could do that, but that's where the super easy stopped and came to a grinding halt. I loaded up my phone, attempted to connect over Bluetooth to check for firmware updates, calibrate, set the crank length, do all the things, the singing and dancing. It just wouldn't detect either pedal over Bluetooth. I tried multiple devices, Bluetooth on and off, took the batteries out, put the batteries back in, stood on one, did all the works, didn't work whatsoever. So I gave up on that after half an hour. I could not connect to the pedals over Bluetooth. I loaded up Zwift, it connected to the Ant Plus ID of the pedals. Happy days. So then I booted up the Edge 520, connected the vector pedals to that over Ant Plus. Happy days, it beeped and sung and it did its dance and set the, uh, the zero offset, crank length, etc. And surprise, surprise, I could then connect via Bluetooth using this app. I don't know what the go was there, but it now works. Whether it's a firmware thing, I'm not quite sure, but these devices, I jumped on the Garmin Vector pedal forums and uh, someone's also got the same issue, so I'm not alone here. And another thing of note this early on, which is hopefully going to be rectified very, very soon, these are only Ant Plus. The Bluetooth connectivity is only to your phone. Um, even though on the box it states Ant Plus and Bluetooth connectivity, there's no Bluetooth power meter. So if you're using Zwift iOS, Zwift to Apple TV, um, yeah, you're in a bit of a pickle until the firmware update comes out for this. So fingers crossed that comes out soon. That was a bit tricky getting that up and running, but it's happy days. Let's uh, let off some steam by installing these cleats and getting out for a ride. Let's get out of here. After installing the pedals, that was three rides I've crammed in so far. That was one longer ride out here for a few hours. That was a short burst around the back streets here, doing some sprints and jumping out of corners. And the Llama Lab test, which I put the pedals up against the Neo and the Drivo and a few other things as well. And as always with the Llama Lab test, let's jump over to DC Ramica's analysis tool and have a look at the data we collected. The Llama Lab test as it stands is a 10 minute warm up where after 10 minutes we stop, calibrate, zero offset everything. We then do a 20 minute block of 200 watts at for 10 minutes. We do 220 watts for 10 minutes, and then we get into a sprint, recovery, sprint, and then some overs and unders at 150, 350, 150, 350, and then some 450s as well. And then a just riding along step test at the end of that. This is interesting, what we saw today. 
So diving into the 20 minute block here, we can see the Neo and the Vector 3s track brilliantly, like surgically well. You can see them there, they're, every little microburst is tracked perfectly. They're just different. Different by about 15 to 20 watts, which is about 10% out. Now, doing the quick math here, the vectors are within 1% accuracy, Neo within 1%, and this drivetrain, let's say, let's give the drivetrain a generous 5% accuracy delta here. So 7% out, but I do straight chain, everything's clean, 5% is pretty generous. We're seeing 10% though, so that's a bit of a concern. Mm. So leave that in the back pocket for now. In the sprints, and from then on, everything was fine. Everything was, the sprints, the response time from the pedals, it's obviously the power meters are on the pedals, they're instant. So they pick up straight away, um, and no hassles whatsoever. A few little bit differences there with the coming back down from a higher 450 into the 150s, and then the step test there, small little kink with the step test right in there where I changed gears on the bike from small ring to big, so to be expected. Other than that slight discrepancy, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Now, I'll side by side wall over and under the exact same test with the P1 pedals. Mmm, mmm, see where I'm going with this? The P1s, they track just fine with erg mode. Now, there will be differences with where power is measured, etc. But what we see with the Neo and the Vectors is there's a separation in steady state, but then just riding along everything's fine. With the P1s, everything's fine all the time. I dug a little deeper. Jumping over to Ray's analysis of one of his rides with the vectors, um, and around about the same zones, using erg mode, steady state, around 200 watts, there's the same. We're seeing a bit of a difference there as well. So you can see the line there, the difference with the vectors compared to the, let's go for the power to max rather than the kicker. Ray seeing a difference there of around, ooh, what's that, 16 to 17 watts higher on the pedals than everything else. It's still a little different there, a little higher there on the pedals, a little higher there on the pedals, a little higher there on the pedals. Hmm, so are we seeing something similar to the Twin Power by Rota where it just read high indoors? I don't know, I can't explain what we're seeing at the moment. I did a few resets, I tried a few different runs. It was always the same kind of data. So it is what it is for now. Reading a little high in steady state erg mode only, but just riding along, absolutely fine. I did then pull out the Drivo. Here's the data from the Drivo. I did a five minute test and a five minute test. The Drivo we saw probably between five and 6% difference, which is within the maximums of everything adding up. Still not what I wanna see. A um, little closer, but, and then just in the riding along, riding along, it matched perfectly. And again, the little step test, pedals and the Drivo, one and the same. So I'm not sure what to conclude with that, whether it's a unbaked firmware, whether it's the um, frequency of updates of the pedal stroke, whether it's the smoothing, I don't know. Is it, It's still pretty early on in the firmware life cycle, I guess, for these pedals. And I guess as soon as we get more people with these pedals out there, putting them up against the Neos and Drivos and Kickers and things like that, we'll get more feedback or Garmin will get more feedback to, uh, I guess, analyze this. Speaking of more data, I found somebody posted up a similar test in Ray's comment section. Now, I'm not sure the source of this data, so take it with a grain of salt. But again, we're seeing the steady state separation there at about 200 watts, but this time it's inverse. The Neo's reading 20 watts higher than the pedals. So three data sources there saying that around 200 watt steady state. Hmm, stay tuned for this. We're gonna to have to dive more into this. There needs to be a lot more data collected. Um, I'm hoping for a few more firmware revisions. We'll see what comes of it. Okay, enough of that for now. Let's get into the summary. After 24 hours of giving these pedals absolute hell, they've held up quite nice. They do address the two biggest issues as mentioned. No pods, no torque wrench required. The Vector 3s are as close to plug and play for a power meter as you're going to get. There's no bottom bracket changing, there's no spider changing, there's no relacing your rear wheels. You put the pedals on, change the cleats if you need be, and ride on. That is as simple as it gets. The pedal metrics and pedaling analysis with these Garmin Vector pedals is a whole video in itself, so stay tuned for that. But what impressed me the most was the platform center offset. It tells you exactly where on the pedal you are putting the power down. Indoors, steady state, triathletes, Ironman, this is brilliant data to know because you need to be putting the power straight down on that pedal, not sideways, not wasting energy anywhere. So it can tell you 
almost where to readjust things. Stay tuned on a video on that. I was super impressed with that pedal metric. One thing I've heard from a lot of people is they like the look of these pedals. They're not pods hanging off the side of your bike. There's no wires, there's no cables. They're just a standard set of pedals that happen to measure power. That's exactly how technology should be. So more on the cleats. You saw them in the video before they really snap in and lock in place. Even the six degree float was pretty secure in a sprint. I still have ordered the zero degree float cleats, the black ones, so they'll be coming later in the week. They were fine. I tried the P1 cleats in these. They snapped in and clipped in, but I wasn't confident enough. So the cleats weren't too bad. The snap in, the step in was all good. Happy days. I'm still a big fan of the Shimano ones, so if only they could make Shimano pedals with power. At $1,000 US, that may be a premium for some, it may be mid-range for others, but there's no question about it. The ease of use and ease of installation is a clear winner and worth a few hundred dollars at least. Availability-wise, there seems to be a limited supply of these things and a luck of the draw with pre-orders. I was lucky to get mine. A few others have said that they've been pushed out to mid-gen 2018. So if you can get a set, grab a set if you want them or go on pre-order, you might be waiting for a while. So after 24 hours of getting to know these pedals quite intimately and dropping a few watt bombs outside and inside, I give them a one and not quite two thumbs up just yet. That will turn as soon as the firmware is out for these that we can get Bluetooth connectivity direct to our iPhones, TVs, via Apple TV, etc. And maybe some explanation about what's going on on those steady state erg modes that are a little higher than what I would expect to see. If you're keen on doing your own power analysis as well, if you've got a set of these and got a smart trainer, DC Ramic and analysis tool is available for everyone. Again, links below to that so you can dive in and we can keep Garmin honest. I think we're a little undercooked on the firmware. No surprises there though. I'll be definitely doing a few more videos on these pedals. The platform analysis is super cool. I really wanna dive headfirst into that, especially for the TT stuff, steady state and optimizing that pedal stroke. So we'll wrap it there for today. Thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned for a lot more on this. The journey is just beginning. Lots of K's coming up.